Welcome to the deep dive. So today our mission is really to cut through some of the noise around the winter 2025, 2026 climate outlook. Yeah, there's a lot swirling around. Definitely. And the main driver, the thing everyone's talking about is this new La Nina event, you know, the cold phase of ENSO. Correct, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. NOAA just put out an advisory. But uh, here's the catch, right? The forecast seems well, unusually complex this year. Volatile, even. That's the word for it. Volatile. Okay, so we're officially in La Nina territory. But let's unpack this crucial nuance you mentioned. It's it's a weak event. Exactly. The latest data, like the Nino 3.4 index, puts it right at the threshold, maybe minus 0.5 degrees Celsius, just yeah. barely scraping into La Nina classification. And that weakness is critical, you're saying? Because yeah. why? Well, because a weak event like this is much less likely to give us those really strong, sustained, classic winter impacts. You know, the whole north gets wet, south stays dry, pattern we usually expect from La Nina. Yeah. Right, that might not lock in reliably for the whole season. Precisely. It makes the whole thing less predictable, less textbook La Nina. Hmm. So if La Nina isn't the only game in town, what else is influencing things? Ah, uh, well, what's fascinating here is that this week, La Nina almost creates a, a vacuum, you could say. It allows other climate drivers, secondary ones, to step up and have a bigger say in regional patterns. Okay, like what? The big one right now is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, the PDO. Yeah. It's strongly negative like really strongly negative. And the August reading was minus 3.23. Wow, that's significant. And the PDO is that long-term temperature pattern in the North Pacific. Exactly. And a negative PDO tends to reinforce a colder, stormier pattern for the northern part of North America. It's like it's giving the weak La Nina a booster shot for certain regions. Ah, okay. So those two working together, that gives us our high confidence zones, especially for snow early on. You got it. That confluence of even a weak La Nina plus that strong negative PDO points very clearly towards consistent, likely above average snow in the Pacific Northwest and the Northern Rockies. Mm. So think Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, colder and snowier there. Makes sense. And the flip side, down south. Equally certain, pretty much. Yeah. High confidence for warmer and uh, definitely drier conditions across the southern U.S. Southwest Gulf Coast. The main storm track just gets shunted north by that combination. Okay. And you mentioned something specific about the Great Lakes, too. Yeah, the lake effect snow, or LES. You know. There's an enhanced risk noted in the forecasts, partly because Arctic sea ice is quite low again this year. Right. Less ice means more open water, more moisture available. Exactly. So if you get cold air blasting over those relatively warmer open lake waters before they freeze solid, mm -hmm. boom, you get those intense localized snow bands. It's a specific setup but the potential is higher this year. Okay, so early season seems somewhat clearer in those specific regions, but then you mentioned volatility. Things break down after New Year's. That's where things get, uh, yeah, really interesting. The late season picture looks potentially quite different. So what's the mechanism? What disrupts the La Nina pattern later on? We have to look way up. Yeah. Stratosphere level, it's the quasi-biennial oscillation, the QBO. The QBO, okay, remind us. High altitude winds over the equator. That's the one. And right now it's in an easterly phase. Now, an easterly QBO significantly increases the odds of the polar vortex weakening later in the winter. And a weak polar vortex can lead to. Sudden stratospheric warming events, or SSWs, usually happens January through March. And when the stratosphere suddenly warms up there, it disrupts the jet stream below, often leading to high latitude blocking. Blocking, meaning big high pressure systems setting up shop in places like Greenland or the Arctic. Exactly, and that blocking pattern can force frigid Arctic air southward, and it dramatically increases the threat, a non-trivial threat of major winter storms like nor'easters or blizzards for the mid-Atlantic and the northeast U.S. Even though La Nina winters historically tend to be drier there. Yes. It overrides the typical La Nina signal. Think back to the winter of 95-96, that was also a weak La Nina. But it delivered some brutal, really extreme blizzard conditions late in the season on the East Coast because of this kind of atmospheric setup. We might be looking at like two different winters rolled into one season. Wow, okay. And does this blocking signal reach across the pond to Europe? It does, but La Nina's direct influence on Europe is generally weaker, more indirect. The real impact comes later aligning with that potential QBO forced blocking. So mid to late winter, Janmar 2026, that's when Europe could see a shift towards colder, stormier conditions. Often linked to a negative NAO, right? North Atlantic Oscillation. Precisely, that's a typical signature of that blocking pattern over the Atlantic sector. So for places like the European Alps, the forecast is pretty mixed early on, 
probably relying on higher altitude resorts, but things could change significantly later. So if we try to connect all these dots, what's the big picture? I think the term bookend winter sums it up pretty well for parts of North America, especially around the Great Lakes, the Midwest, maybe the Northeast. You get potentially strong activity early, driven by that La Nina PDO combo. Right, the lake effect, the northern track storms. Uh-huh, and then maybe a lull, followed by potentially strong, high-impact activity late in the season, driven by that whole QBO, stratospheric warming, blocking sequence. Okay, so what does this all really mean for planning, for people listening? The key takeaway isn't the seasonal average. Forget the average. The forecast is the volatility. The volatility itself. Yes. That weak La Nina is actually forecast to fade towards e and so neutral conditions by late winter, maybe a 55% chance by Jan Moore. That transition period, combined with the potential for stratospheric disruption, it creates a high risk of what you might call low probability, but high consequence events. Like those late season blizzards in the Northeast, or maybe a sudden cold snap in Europe. Exactly. So managing that uncertainty, that risk of extremes, especially late in the season, mm -hmm. that's the real challenge this winter. The volatility is the forecast you need to plan for.